Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second in our Justice Talks series. Uh, I'm delighted to this evening to be able to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Martin Krieger. As I don't know why I'm doing this, everybody here knows, I, I assume, that Martin is the author of some uh, nine books which cover the, the field in which he's become such a master of running across social, political, and, and legal theory. He is the Gordon Samuels Professor of, of Law and Social Theory in the law school at this university. He's co-director of the Network for Interdisciplinary Studies in Law at, at UNSW, amongst a number of other connections, including his role at Regnet, at, based at, at, at ANU. And he's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in, in Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge the Academy's support in hosting this event this evening. Of the, the books that I, the nine books that I, I mentioned before, the, the one which we are particularly celebrating tonight and which Martin will be talking about in, in his lecture is his wonderful book on Philip Selznick, Ideals in the Modern World, published this year by Stanford University Press. And it's my great pleasure to ask Martin to come to speak to us. Thank you. Um, I think the only thing that could cap being introduced in such nice and generous terms by your dean might be to listen to the eulogies at your funeral, because in both occasions, bad things which may well be said are not said. And I'm happy since, while I will be at the other occasion, I won't be listening, to have had the chance at least to listen today. Uh, my topic, my title, is, uh, as many of you will have guessed, a pastiche of two other titles. One, that of Philip Selznick, about whom you'll hear more than you have ever heard tonight. Um, his last book, written when he was 89, or published when he was 89, A Humanist Science, that's obviously part of the title, but it's also uh, connected with the very famous uh, lecture of Max Weber's, which he delivered in 1918, uh, Science as a Vocation. Each of these publications occurred two years before the author's death. Come to think, I'm not feeling that great myself, but that is not where, where this is heading. Uh, rather, I want to evoke uh, what might be involved in thinking or living humanist science as a vocation, suggesting that it's a nice thing to try, suggesting also that there may be reasons why it's a harder thing to try today than it may have been or than perhaps it should be, and finally suggesting that that is a pity. There are many other good things in the world, but that is a pity. It seems to me there are two ways that I could approach, or that anyone could approach, this sort of to topic, and one would be to take those big abstract nouns in the, or not all nouns, big abstract words in the title, and examine them, humanism, science, vocation. Then, if the spirit moves you, you could move on to the life of the mind, uh, community of scholars, pursuit of truth, and other worthies. And that, some people can do that effectively, and Ray, Raymond Gator is one who can do it effectively, but not many can, and not often. Because a discussion at that level of abstraction threatens always to rise into the skies as a form of hot air, which the uh, Princeton philosopher Harry Frankfurt characterizes or describes in the following terms. Hot air is generated when what comes out of the speaker's mouth is mere vapor. His speech is empty, without substance or content. No more information is communicated than if the speaker had merely exhaled. And that's one common way in which these concepts are discussed. Unfortunately, there's another way. Instead of ascent, one can descend. Uh, 
into what Frankfurt, who made of this an academic category, into bullshit, which, as Frankfurt explains, is unavoidable whenever circumstances require someone to talk without knowing what he's talking about. <laughs> Thus, the production of bullshit is stimulated whenever a person's obligations or opportunities to speak about some topic are more excessive than his knowledge of the facts that are relevant to the topic. Frankfurt observes in passing that there's a lot of that about and that indeed it's one of the pervasive uh, features of our culture and of course no member of a modern university needs to be reminded, even a university that never stands still <laughs> needs to be reminded that bullshit is around us. Uh, but there's another option. There's another option, and it's the one that I prefer to take. Uh, it's what might be expected of a common lawyer. I'm going to focus on a case, a rather an extended case since it lasted 91 years, and that is the life work of Philip Selznick. Not yet a household name in most households, I guess, in this room, but it will become one shortly, or if it takes longer, longly. Uh, there's a lot to say, and I was thinking just to read the book, uh, but I'll, I'll restrain myself, at least from that. Much of what I say will be simply uh, descriptive and interpretive, but some of it can also be understood as a lament. I hope not to drive you to tears, and certainly I hope not to bore you there, but I also wouldn't want you to leave here too cheerful. So I'm going to try to evoke and exemplify uh, humanist, humanist science as a vocation through the works and the preoccupations and the character of mind of the person who, very late in his life, came to choose this phrase, humanist science, to describe his ambition and what he thought had motivated his work through that life. Selznick, and now this is information, Selznick uh, wrote constantly from the late 30s, and he was a major contributor to many disciplinary fields, particularly in sociology, organizational sociology, where he was the founder of what was called the old institutionalism, general sociology, where he wrote the best-selling textbook in sociology in America for over 30 years, sociology of law, where he founded the unique, still unique, jurisprudence and social policy program in uh, Berkeley and published a great deal and formed a center which continues or claims to continue his works. Uh, then moving somewhat later in life, obviously enough, uh, to social philosophy, where he came, he, his, I think, master work, 500, 600 pages, The Moral Commonwealth, and uh, then after that, Partly, as he told me, because having gone blind in his last 10 years, he couldn't do what he'd always imagined he'd do in retirement, carpentry. So he wrote two successor books to the Moral Commonwealth. Now, there's a lot there, and his contributions in each of these fields have been very important. One of the shames of his gadding about so is that very often people where he had been an enormous figure in the field had no idea where, where he'd gone and assumed he was dead, but he outlived them all, uh, whereas people into, which, into whose field he merged, or in whose field he emerged, didn't know where he came from. I think that is a shame. I think it's a pity. I think that the coherence, the, the cumulative power of his contributions is enormous. But I'm haunted, and the book is haunted, and, and I hope you'll be haunted, by a remark by his erstwhile disciple, uh, Philippe Nonet, who said, those who look to Philip for contributions to industrial sociology, sociology of law, sociology of organizations, social philosophy, are sure to find something, indeed, a great deal. But they'll miss everything that matters. He's an exaggerator. They'll miss lots that matters. And it's what those lots consist of that I'll seek to uh, suggest in, in, the time, in the time remaining. I'll do it. Uh, first of all, by sketching the works or a bit about them. Uh, secondly, by trying to uh, glean a couple of underlying concerns which run through them all. Thirdly, by suggesting uh, 
some aspect of what I've claimed, I'm claiming now and I've certainly sought to demonstrate in the book, are, or is, a cast of mind of great distinction and distinctiveness. And finally, the lament, I'll ask why, as I claim, it's unlikely that modern universities will generate many people of this sort of formation. Now, he wrote other works, but these are the ones which seem to me most significant. And like many very clever young people in New York in the late 30s, if you have read anything about City College of New York, which uh, brought a lot of people to an intellectual life, the intellectual life was galvanised less by the lectures they attended, which for many of them were mediocre, than by the alcoves which surrounded the cafeteria and City College. Alcove 1 had the Trotskyists, Alcove 2 had Stalinists. There were ping pong players, Catholics, blacks. There was a whole range of people who segregated. Alcove 1 were not allowed to talk to Alcove 2. Actually, it was the other way because there was no discipline in Alcove 1. Alcove 2, the Stalinists, were not allowed to talk to the Trotskyists. And this was a remarkably clever group of people who later became significant in American public life, intellectual life, academic life. If I mention some names, Irving Kristol, Gertrude Himmelfarb, Seymour Martin Lipset, Peter Rossi, Irving Howe. This was, they were off, as often fighting with each other as agreeing with each other, but they were certainly, as Selznick put it once in a memoir, having a discussion. These discussions usually took about 10 hours, but they were having discussions all the time. There was a split that what held Trotskyists together was that they were fundamentally disappointed idealists. Both those things are important. They were idealists, they were for the revolution, they thought it was a great thing, but they were fundamentally disappointed because their charismatic hero and leader, Trotsky, had been done. He had been destroyed and then he was killed uh, by Stalin. But in the time between his political destruction, his death, there were loyal followers and the ones in New York happened to turn out to be very important, both because they were intellectually important and because once he was on to his last exile in Coyoacan in, in Mexico, they were the closest people to him. So he had a connection with them. There was a it's so tempting to go into this uh, because it's the most interesting moment in his life and the one that uh, no one else knows. Uh, but I'll, again, restrain myself. This talk will be an exercise in restraint. Um, what was fundamental about... He was a Trotskyist, then he was part of a dissident faction of Trotskyists, the Shachmanites. Then within that distant, dissident faction, he, under the party name Sherman, set up the Shermanites, which was a faction within a faction. This is how Trotskyist politics operates. And there were two fundamental... In the, his faction of the faction of the Trotskyists, he and Irving Kristol started a little magazine, which, much of which he wrote. It didn't take a lot to write much of it because there was very little. Uh, but he did write a lot then, and there were two overarching conflicts which shaped him intellectually. One was between Trotsky, the idealist, who had only he succeeded would have led them to the promised land, or led the world to the promised land, and an interlocutor that, uh, intellectually an interlocutor, of course they never met, that Selznick took to have an answer to Trotsky, which shaped his own thinking for much of the rest of his life. The German uh, social theorist and then fascist, but in between that socialist, Roberto Michels. Trotsky represented and sought to rationalise heroic failure. The hero heroism went with the territory. The failure went because Stalin beat him, beat him and then killed him. And he had a theory for it. Since he was a Marxist, of course, he had a theory for it. And the theory was all built around a f an unpredictable failure of class forces to support uh, the, the, the Bolshevik position, which he took to be his own position. He had to find, because it's in Marxism as a theory, some socioeconomic category, like a class, which you can blame, and he blamed the Soviet bureaucracy. In ways that no one could predict, he said, we got done by the Soviet bureaucracy. And talk of bureaucracy was ever present in the Trotskyist movement at that time. 
because there was worries about bureaucratism in the movement and much more deeply because bureaucracy was held to have defeated the revolution. Michels had published a book in 1911 in German. The translation in, in the English translation was out of print and by luck Selznick got onto a copy of it in 1938-39. The book, very famous book, was called Political Parties. Uh, political Parties, it was about, and I'll get the rest of the words wrong, the origins of what he called the iron law of oligarchy. Michel's argument was that quite apart from hostile class forces, you had to look at the organisational tendencies within any social movement, particularly any democratic movement, particularly any fighting democratic movement, to realise that there were imminent tendencies towards oligarchy. The people would never rule because the rulers, the, uh, the power, would gravitate to the top. Selznick was enormously impressed with that at two levels. He was impressed at it at the specific level. He believed that that's what had happened in, in the Soviet Union. And he believed that at a general level, it meant for him that if you were interested in the pursuit of ideals, you had to be enormously realistic and play close attention to the particular means, the organisational means that you were using to, or that you were caught with to, to achieve those ideals. Unless you were realistic, unless you were prepared to rub your nose into the grubby realities of corridor skills, as Trotsky loftily called them, then uh, your, ideals, your ideals, however beautifully expressed, were worthless. That was one conflict. At the same time, he was reading a lot of philosophy. He and his wife, his then wife, was, were reading a lot of philosophy. Particularly, they were influenced by the progressive idealism of the great uh, public philosopher of America, John Dewey. But Selznick was also reading the works of a contemporary theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr. And Niebuhr's attack, for Niebuhr, Dewey was the example of the can-do naive American who imagines that evil is always something that is uh, contingent, something that you shouldn't really expect to find in the more and the, in the core of human activities and human nature. Selznick, in a way I think that is remarkable as a matter of a cast of mind, for the whole of his life had this internal struggle between the idealism he'd inherited from Dewey, which is not simply a term idealism, it was Dewey's idealism that he inherited. Belief in democracy is not simply a political virtue but an epistemological one, that's how you learn things. That's how science gets mimicked in social affairs. That on the one hand, and the, I've called him a Hobbesian idealist because it is those two things he keeps in tension all his life, the lesson of Niebuhr that don't be surprised when evil happens. Don't be surprised when your ideals hit the dust because something uh, that you, in your lofty uh, musings, hadn't thought about comes to, to catch you. And a lot of those articles in, in Inquiry were making this sort of point. At the same time as he was politically active, actually very active, he was an organiser in the Joe Hill unit in, in New York. He was, he was an active young Trotskyist. He had a lot of followers. Not a lot. He had significant followers, <laughs> one or two. Uh, at the same time as that was happening, he was beginning a doctorate under the great sociologist Robert Merton. Many other figures in sociology of the first, second half of the century were Merton's students. Merton didn't give them much guidance, and he was trying to work out what he could do for his doctorate topic, and he was intrigued by the remarks of the head of a unique and novel American public entity, the Tennessee Valley Authority, set up by Roosevelt during the New Deal. It covered, it was a federal agency, which was on the one hand a government agency, was supposed to have the flexibility of non-government activity. It was a planning agency, unlike many things unique in, in American history. And its chairman, David Lilienthal, who had read the sorts of things that, that uh, Selznick had read, said, look, we don't have the problem, the Michelle's problem, because while certain aspects of government are going to be handled centrally, the administration is going to be localised. It'll be administration 
at the grassroots. And Selznick, fresh from Michelle, said, oh, I know what I'm, I'm going to find. There's nothing like that. All the power will go to the top. So he went to Tennessee, did some research before he was called for war service, and then published the book after the war. It was an enormously, it was a little book, but enormously influential book. It made his name, it made his career. It's one of the foundation texts in post-war organisational sociology. But what he found was that in their zeal to co-opt the word that he used, local notables, so that they wouldn't get in the way of the tasks that the central authority set themselves, Michel's got the opposite of the truth. In fact, the head, the government, had given away the store. These local notables weren't just local guys. They were rich, they were powerful, they were white. They had their interests. Once you brought them into the camp because you didn't want them, you know, the expression, outwards, it turns out they had taken over the the, uh, the store. I can't express any of the nuance and subtlety and insight in that wonderful little book, but I just want to say that in relation to Michel's, specifically Michel's was trumped in a sense because this was the opposite of what he predicted. There was no oli oligarchy. In fact, the, the leaders couldn't get the organisation to do what they wanted to do. On the other hand, Michel's at the level of ideals and means was vindicated for Selznick. Again, you saw idealists have to be fundamentally realistic about... Now, these are only phrases, so you have to see it in the way that he works it through. How does he... What does he go on for? Again, somewhat adventitiously, a little after that, he was asked to do a book on communism. He knew a lot about communism because of his Trotskyist past. He wrote a book, a wonderful book, called The Organisational Weapon, which focuses on communist organisational tactics. For him, communists, he loathed their values by this stage, nevertheless got right what the TVA didn't understand. That is, communism has this particular task, not known in post offices and not many universities either. It has to make out of its recruits deployable agents. Not an easy thing to do. You have to do it if you're running a terrorist organisation as well, and maybe his book... Well, his book is supposed to be reprinted, uh, and I've got to write the introduction to it, so I'll make that point. Uh, it's what do, what do you do with an organisation to have this result? It's terribly important and terribly hard, because it's not just your enemies. You hate your enemies, but you're f fishing in a sea where there are all your friends who you have to beat. And how do you do that with an organisation? For him, organisational weapon was a study of how communists understood the complex activity of leadership in organisations. And therefore, or not therefore, but then, he published a book which sought to distill these differing lessons and had an enormous success in management schools. To his embarrassment a little... Trotskyist, uh, but enormous success. It's still in print. And that was leadership in administration. He distinguished between the organisational theory which had come down to sociology through, through Weber and many other people, which focused on modern organisations as impersonal, machine-like entities which the leader directs, much more machine-like than any other form of administration in, in the history of the world. This is Weber's argument. Selznick says, look, it might be distinctive in that, but that's not characteristic of the way they work. Institutions, sorry, organisations get quickly, typically, institutionalised. People within them have group affections, they get loyalties to each other, also to the organisation. It might have a myth like the Marines, it's not just like uh, something else, you have a devotion to it. This is, on the one hand, gives energy to a leader of such an organisation, but also makes it sticky. You can't just do what you like with it. What that requires of a leader is that they involve themselves in institutionalisation, defined by Selznick as infusing an organisation with value beyond the specific technical requirements of the task at hand. That is the genius, the, the, the job of an administrative leader as distinct from a manager. He has a lot of scathing things to say about this distinction. In a lot of administrative work, you only need management because it's not critical, it just hums along. But a leader has to make these critical 
character-defining decisions. They're not easy to make. They take a lot of insight. He explores what's involved, and he explores the significance of that. Now, there's one shift. This is a sort of distillation of what went before, but there's also a shift. He was, in his earlier writings, a master debunker. You show me an ideal, and I'll show that they haven't thought through the implications of what's needed to make it real and so on. By leadership and administration, his moral ambition turns. He wants to see, OK, these are all the difficulties. But if you want to do something valuable, if you want to redeem some virtues or some values, then how do you go about it? You can't just preach them. You have to really come to grips with the stuff of which, uh, that, that you're uh, involved with. So he was the man. And he had the sociology textbook, which, bought it, which was enormously successful. He went to Berkeley in 1952. And almost immediately, he started to interest himself in that wasteland which we know as sociology of law. Nobody was doing it. No mainstream American sociologists were doing it. Of course, the great tradition, Durkheim Weber, were the fundamental in this, but not American sociology, which had nothing to say about law. Uh, and he got into it. And already in the mid-50s, he was attending law school, he was going to seminars, he was educating himself in a profound way, in detail of law as well as thinking sociologically about law. And the first publication, the emanation of that immersion, is this wondrous, I think, article, Sociology and Natural Law, the argument of which is horror to sociologists. No one has said this to them before. Sociologists and natural lawyers have a lot in common. Natural lawyers were so happy about that either because they didn't think too well of sociologists, but certainly nobody would like that combination. And he argued that there were various prejudices that sociologists had which blinded them to the need, first of all, to take the philosophical equipment fundamental in law, its values, its concepts, what is legality, what is justice, what is fairness, all these things which, you, if you're going to do sociology of law, you can't simply abstract yourself from the language and the, the, what is in, in, uh, motivating the people who are involved. And he said, sociologists commonly, he said in the later thing, our keenest minds in the social sciences didn't know what to do with an ideal except handle it gingerly and view it with alarm. And he thought that this was a mistake. It was an intellectual mistake, not a, simply a, a value mistake. It was an intellectual mistake because he said that what sociology of the orthodox sort ignored and didn't have any way of dealing with there was a fact that many of our fundamental practices form what he called normative systems. Think of parenthood, socialization, culture, he believed. He had a wonderful piece, normative theory of culture. Universities, law. That is, these are conjuries of practices, institutions, and people who aren't just randomly collected, but the activities of which have a tendency to, as he put it, a tendency to evaluation. And it was proper for, it was necessary for a sociologist to look at, try to, to discern and argue what were the values appropriate, often latent, often uh, disfigured, often ignored, but appropriate to a particular normative practice of, or normative system of this sort or another sort, and then explore further what might be done to generate for these values to, to flourish. One thing is just to work out, well, what's appropriate to socialization? What are you after this? It's not the same as what's appropriate to law or what's appropriate to parenthood. So it's not enough to have some fancy value like justice or fairness. You have to focus in the particular character, the particular social formation that you are uh, interested in, and then you can ask questions. Often they are philosophical questions, but they are grounded in sociological investigation. What could one, what, what are the opportunities and what could be done to allow values appropriate to that practice, that system, to flourish? The Law Society and Industrial Justice I mean, he had this talent for dull names. Who would buy such a book? But uh, if you write a book about it, you've got to read it. Uh, is, I think, is an extraordinary book, but you wouldn't know it by the cover. Uh, and it is that because he says, look, we live in 
it's the, the fate of administered man in modern societies that much of our life is spent in large organisations. Our law, which he goes through in great detail, property law, corporation law, contract law, fails to cope with the reality of the modern organisation. And this is not just a passing thing, like going to the post office. This is where we spend a great deal of our lives. And it's appropriate that certain values, like the rule of law, might be engendered in such organisations to curb the arbitrariness of, or potential arbitrariness, of leaders of them. Now, remember, he starts with Marx, and he's a sociologist. What do you do? Well, what a lawyer would say, well, if that's what you want, pass a law. But that's no chop for Selznick. He says, well, first of all, you've got to know the... What, what, what are we... It's not that it's... People have been oppressed all the time. No news in that. Maybe there are chances now because of social developments, because of incipient, inchoate developments, which he looks for in the organisations, which make now a time when certain values might be uh, nourished in them. Law and Society in Transition is an enormously important book, uh, and I won't say anything about it, because I'm running out of time, as always happens. In the early 80s, he moved to a more reflective, less uh, investigative form of writing. And the great work of this period is The Moral Commonwealth, which is a work of extraordinary erudition and scholarship and a sort of architecture which brings this meditation on an enormous number of great thinkers to bear on what for him are fundamental questions. What could engender moral competence, and more than that, moral well-being among individuals, institutions, and communities in the conditions of modernity, about which he has a great deal of wisdom to shed. Modernity is the problematic condition which makes traditional ways of doing things uh, less available than they were. This is a mixed curse-blessing, blessing-curse, and things can be said about it. Then, uh, that's very briefly, but already too long, uh, the trajectory of, of some of his work. Now, I want to... S what is it which links these works? Because if he's talked about it all, he's talked about for TVA or by industrial lawyers or sociologists of labour, sociology of... Uh, uh, sociology of organisations. He's never talked, until this book... Uh, at a higher level of abstraction with the question, what is it or is there anything which makes of this life's work something coherent? It's a developing coherent, a complex coherence, but a real coherence. And I think at the level of subjects, and I'll speak at a different level in a moment, at the level of subjects, two things connect them all. The first is that all his work, whatever it's about, however distant one title seems from another title, all of his work has to do with uh, what he recalled in the preface to the Moral Commonwealth. Here's a guy, it's 1992, he's very old by then, or not very, he became very older, but he was old, and his preface starts with his Trotskyist youth, and he says, my youthful encounter with revolutionary socialism established a theme that influenced my work over many years, the fate of ideals in the court, course of social practice. Most of my specialised writings in the sociology of organisations, sociology of law, have been preoccupied with the conditions and processes that frustrate ideals or instead give them life and hope. Again, you have this uh, Michel's Dewey, uh, um, Niebuhr, frustrate ideals, give them life and hope. He's constantly insisting you have to be alert to the former and alive to, to the latter. So that's the substantive connector of all of these very varied subjects. Methodologically, he says, well, you can't do this. You can't have this interest and operate the way so many social scientists do with their value-free methods, with their ignorance of other disciplines, with their particular ignorance of most things except sociology, and more specifically of moral philosophy, of history, uh, and of many of the humanities. 
And that was not just a, an idle conceit for him. He set up the jurisprudence and social policy program, as I mentioned, which is unique in the States because it gets together within the law school 15 dedicated positions in various of the disciplines, history, economics, sociology, political science, uh, philosophy, and so on. And the ambition, only partly realised, was to get out of these 15 a Selznick. Uh, and it, I think I say only partially realised because these are normal workaday academics, so the economists to, to economists outside the, 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 the camp and sociologists to sociologists. It's hard to get them together, but that was very much his ambition. A humanist science is one which is, in his case, grounded in sociology, because he was, his sense of himself was that he was fundamentally a sociologist, who has to reach out, not by abandoning sociology, but by taking serious cognizance of philosophy, history, and other things. And of course, fundamental for him were not just values at large or ecological values that they were important to him, but values as they affected human beings. And so humanities and, and the humanist tradition. But that's at the level of subjects. What had came to impress me more and uh, to attract me more was not the subject. I had no interest in any, much of this stuff. Why should I care about American uh, labor law or the Tennessee Valley Authority, which I thought was in Kentucky, because I knew it was south. So these were not the things that drew me to him. What drew me to him was his cast of mind and his sensibility. And I mentioned just quickly a few things of those. And those, uh, that is what I've tried to evoke in the book. And I, I, I do think that it's, it's special. One aspect, I mean, each of these books, except the sociology textbook, had a specific subject. As I mentioned, TVA, uh, communism, leadership, and so on. But what you get very quickly, reading any book by uh, Selznick, is evidence of what he once called his generalizing impulse. So none of these books is about just its subject or even the specific theme that might come out of that subject. Each of them strains to take on larger themes. For example, leadership and administration, which Ralph Lauren puts on the Polo website as his inspiration for making all that money, has these enormously uh, eloquent uh, Expositions of why leadership in an organisation requires some of the virtues and involves some of the dilemmas and some of the values of statesmanship. And it looks very odd. I mean, Ralph, Ralph Pollard must have been happy to have heard it, but it's not what he went uh, to get. Now, why this general impulse? Well, partly, I think, because of the largeness of his subject. He's constantly asking himself what leads to the frustration and what might lead to the flourishing of values apt for, latent within, as he wants to claim, important normative systems in the world. Now, to do that, you've got some difficulty. First of all, you call on philosophy. And one difficulty with philosophers is that though it is alleged that they live in the world, not many of them have any brief with it except of an anecdotal sort. That is, they don't study the world. It's beneath them, or at least it's not their business. Maybe it's, it's, it's d not dirty work, but it's somebody else's work, not their own. Sociologists, on the other hand, particularly those who don't know what to do with an ideal, except handle it gingerly and view it with alarm, are not particularly interesting about what he also wants to say. What is the worth of certain values in certain circumstances? Sociologists can be uh, revelatory about a whole range of things, but the issues of principle and value were important to him, uh, you don't find from them. And this leads me finally to uh, my conclusion and my lament. And I don't think it's going to be so moving that you need to re reach for your handkerchiefs, but it does seem to me that uh, when I think of Selznick, the stature, the cast of mind that he has, the... I, I, I could, sorry, I should have mentioned too, but that's specific to him, it doesn't go with the territory generally. His sensibility made up of two things which coalesce. One is what I've called his Hobbesian idealism. Uh, this refusal to say because something is intention, you've got to make a choice. Why not? Why not try to work seriously out what are the conditions of... Uh, 
What are the threats that he was a threat expert? Frank Nerfelmacher, who influenced me, once prided he was accused by someone of being a threat expert. He said, Yes, that's what I am. And Selznick said, he didn't say, Selznick was a great threat expert. But what was distinctive about him was he said that's only part of the deal. His close friend Irving Kristol, who became the father of neoconservatism, was also a threat expert. And Selznick was very deeply fond of him and it was reciprocated, but he said that's not enough. It's, a, it's fundamental to work out what threats there might be. We, we, we aren't promised peace in our time. But it's also fundamental, once your defences are secured or once you can do what you can, not to imagine that you're always in the same predicament as you might have been when they were insecure. And so all sorts of things become available at least to think about in Selznick, which those of his colleagues who followed Niebuhr couldn't think about. They said, well, compared to what? As I said for much of my life, compared to what? Which is a good beginning answer. It'll solve a lot of problems, but it won't solve all your problems. Apart from his Hobbesian idealism, there is connected with it what he called his, he said his, the, the political position to which he came in his last years was one he called communitarian liberalism. And he said, this requires a high toleration for ambiguity, which certainly it does, and which he had in spades. There was a kind of fundamental judiciousness about him and thoughtfulness which made him duller than some writers who didn't have that. I always thought, he's so much cleverer than Foucault but no one's going to go and buy Selznick when they could be charged by Foucault. It's never going to happen. Why are we not going to get many of these people out of our modern universities? Well, it seems to me that uh, partly, uh, though this may change given the nature of the modern European crisis, financial crisis, his generation was already intellectually informed by reflection on very important matters in the world before they were educated. In the modern hyper and large university, the intellectual formation of many of its even best denizens is generated almost solely by the discipline. They are, in Foucault's terms, highly disciplined by the strictures and limits of the disciplines in which they work. That, of course, has uh, benefits in terms of precision, in terms of, of power, perhaps, but it has a real price in terms of spaciousness of concern, generosity of, of, of what one consider, the, the largeness of what you take on board. And of course, to go for that largeness carries its own risks, particularly given the size and speed and technicization, professionalization, scientization of the modern university. You can try all you like to keep up to even your own discipline and still be left behind. Amateurishness beckons. And even uh, if it were these internal pressures not enough, there are a lot of pressures from outside. I could have talked at this lament of many of these outside pressures. Many of you have heard of them. The uh, framing of universities in terms of uh, economic and bureaucratic thoughts and models which... Uh, to the way of thinking of many, uh, are particularly bad for certain conceptions of the university and certainly certain conceptions of the humanities. I could talk about that. I'm always tempted to talk about that, and occasionally I do talk about these external pressures. We have, though, a lot of discussion of that. Discussion's not the right word, a lot of noise. Uh, in and around the universities. And I'm, I promised you that I wouldn't rise to hot air or descend to bullshit. So I won't. I'll just uh, quote one warning on these external pressures uh, from Selznick in that he delivered in 1953. The default of leadership shows itself in an acute form when organisational achievement or survival is confounded with institutional success. To be sure, no institutional leader can avoid concern for the minimum conditions of continued organisational existence, but he fails if he permits sheer organisational achievement in resources, stability or reputation to become the criterion of his success. A university led by administrators without a clear sense of values to be achieved may fail dismally while steadily growing larger and more secure. Now I said that I won't focus on that 
external. But, but I'll end by focusing on just some of the consequences of our modern specialization. Selznick was interviewed by a bunch of students in a, there's a videotape, of, I mean, it's on the web. And he said, when asked why he went into sociology, uh, that he went because it was a house that had and would have many mansions, that it would be possible to be a rather free-roving intellectual and follow one's own bent without being too constrained by the necessities of the more tightly organised disciplines. Well, that house, of course, as we know, has grown, grown and there are many more mansions and the population that's housed in it is enormous, but the conditions of occupancy have changed dramatically and not in the direction that he uh, wished, I think, or that he exemplified. Now, all of this requires a great discussion. It's, there are advantages in it, but there's also a price. And if I can conclude from the conclusion of my favourite book on my favourite author, uh, it's simply this. Not every stride made by specialisation and expertise can sensibly be regarded as progress. Their rigours aren't always as attractive as they can be impressive. Questions pose diminish in significance, while ways of answering them become ever more sophisticated. We're cleverer about how to explore, less interesting about what. Apart from what people come to do, there's a eugenic aspect to this. What intellectual categories and talents come to be bred in and out of an increasingly specialised and technicised world is a question deserving scientific scrutiny itself. Perhaps that's what Max Weber had in mind when he foreshadowed for the, that polymath, that extraordinary polymath, he foreshadowed for the last man of our cultural development the potential triumph of specialists without spirit, sensualists without heart. This nullity imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never before achieved. Perhaps, too, it explains his alleged retort to a complaint that he ventured beyond his field. I'm not a donkey and I don't have a field. Perhaps those trends are unavoidable and perhaps they should be applauded, but they also have a price. And in, given your indulgence, I've tried to suggest uh, something about where that price might lie. Thanks very much. I'm just a little unsure what you meant by humanism in the, uh, or humanistic science, because you didn't articulate the sense that he was a humanist. Uh, he certainly appreciated Marx's humanist writings more than any other writings. He writes about them a little. I think he once used this phrase. He had various iterations. He said sociology has to be a normative theory, a normative science. And then in an unpublished lecture in Berkeley in 1973, a public lecture, public but unpublished, uh, he used the phrase humanist science. And then his last book, in the course of which his mind started to wander, but he already had the phrase. Uh, I saw a lot of him at the time that he was writing that, and he, he had found this lecture, and he said, look, I was using the term then. So I don't think I used it because I thought I was warranted by his using it. All I can give you is certain things I know that he believes, and he connected with the humanist science. One is uh, that the moral loads... He, he was a sociologist of a time when people talked systems. There's a lot about systems. And he insisted, and, and he, was, he, he did talk systems. But he said, morally, the touchstone is the human person, the individual human person. That's number one. So ultimately, that's got to be the test. Not systems, not states, not organisations. Organisations are huge in his conception of the world, in their significance. They have not an ontological reality, but a sociological reality, which is enormous. But still, it's the individual person that he, the human, that he wants. Secondly, he, it, it's, it's drawn a lot from Dewey, that Dewey talked a lot about values, but the values for him were always values as related to humans. Thirdly, uh, he says that he once, in the last book, and in the 73 essay, uh, he... It's not adequate as an answer, but it is his answer, the only time I've found him actually say, this is what I mean by humanist science. He says, it's the study, um, it's an analytic and empirical study of ideals understood as at once latent in and threatened by the vagaries of social life. So that's what he says. Then 
it had a looser connection with the humanities. And part of what he wanted to say was, you can't be a complete social theorist without deep, and he had deep, you know, he couldn't match it with Philip Pettit, but he, he had deep knowledge and erudition and understanding of a great deal of moral philosophy, uh, a great deal of it. And it went deep in him, it went long in his, in his reading and widened his reading. And so an openness, a deliberate, ultimately hoped, a disciplined openness to the humanities was part of it. But it's not a tight response, but it's in that sort of area. Martin, I'm wondering how far you can locate him within the history of sociology itself. You mentioned he started under Merton, so to that extent he was highly professionalised. Merton had quite a lot to say about Weber. He applies Weber's uh, Protestantism and the spirit of capitalism to the, the relation between religion and science. Can one see him as, in a sense, uh, part of a uh, linear descent from Weber? In what, to what extent can we he locate key influences in the shaping of his early You know, uh, a reviewer of this book said that I don't mention contemporaries by whom he was influenced and I realise in the law and society movement and I realise I can't think of one but I can think about predecessors and uh, the biggest formative influence on him were or influences were mainly philosophers Dewey, Morris Cohen and Ernst Nagel or at least by the time I got to know him well you know, he'd been doing a lot of his sociology before I met him. Uh, in sociology, he, was, he had a very well-furnished mind, and he did the sociology text, so he was on top of all of that. Weber, for him, like for everybody, is, is great and significant in a number of books. It's significant in, um, in particularly Law, Society, Industrial Justice, where he looks at the significance of bureaucratization. He's significant as a foil in... Uh, leadership and administration where he says, look, Weber got what may be distinctive about Western bureaucracies, but he hasn't told us how they work. And, and the way they work, you can't get clues from, from them. He um, claimed he, he had enormous respect for Merton as a teacher and he claimed he got nothing substantive from Merton. Now, that there may be more than... That may not be true. Uh, in, in TVA, which has a lot to do with the unanticipated consequences of social action, which is the title of a great essay of Merton's, uh, he told me, look, I put that in, the title, and, and, and it's a key theme of TVA that you have all these unanticipated consequences. The leaders didn't know when they were bringing these guys in that they would take over the store. He said, I put in unanticipated consequences, because I liked Merton a lot and I was doing the doctorate under him. But the first version had objective consequences, because that's what we Trotskyists kept saying. We kept attacking each other. You say you're not, you're not a Stalinist, but the objective consequences of your act are. And that's appropriate to the idiom. Um, look, he was influenced by VAR. I think Durkheim is more significant for him, particularly as he becomes more communitarian. Uh, he, Durkheim is significant. Marx is significant, but not the Marx he read as a Marxist, to come back to Robert's question. In his later works, he's fond of the young Marx, but he's not fond of the Marx that he read when he was a Marxist. Clearly, so the mind is well furnished, but my sense is the stuff which has actually been part of his own, come part of his own mind, as distinct from the tools of the trade and the people you have to take into account, were the ones I mentioned in the beginning, particularly Dewey. Uh, and again, there is a, a wonderful, insightful, and in many ways wrong headed essay by Philippe Nonet, who was his disciple, loved him to the end, but having written uh, Law and Society in Transition with him, denounced it and everything it stood for about two years later. But he wrote an essay, the argument of which was that Selznick's trajectory was from Weber to Aristotle, this more communitarian and more um, the flourishing later philosophy, it says, social philosophy of flourish. There's something in that. 
I was just intrigued by your uh, phrase in the last, uh, in, in that earlier answer. You said uh, he, he couldn't match it with Philip uh, Pettit. <coughs> I wonder if you could unpack that idea a little bit further, because we're talking about something <coughs> very ample, for, about whom you're making a very large claim. And Careful, because one day Philip might look at the podcast. Um, <coughs> I take Philip Pettit, the, who is an enormously significant modern social and moral philosopher, very influential, particularly with his book on republicanism. I could have said Rawls, because they have this in common, is that they write works of a kind of, on the one hand, austerity of principle. That is, there is going to be one central theme on which this vast edifice gets constructed. And it's an edifice constructed by the power of argument. And Selznick argued well. He was no fool. In fact, he was very smart. But he, <coughs> he was not enamoured of that style. He once said to me about rules, when I asked him that, he said, uh, look, he's a very clever guy, and I agree with a lot of what he says, but why do you have to go through all of that palaver, the original position, etc., when you say this is what I think should be done. Uh, which was more, he was not an abstract, his was not, it was a theoretical mind and it was a generalising mind, but it was not an abstract argument-focused mind. It was evidence-driven as much. It was reflection of a non-ad hoc sort. A lot of philosophers, and I don't think it's uh, wrong to say of Philip, whom I, of, of, of Pettit, whom I admire a lot, uh, get their examples, their worldly examples, ad hoc, from what they pass in the street or what they've heard or what strikes them as something, partly because the facts don't matter because you could invent a possible world to do your job as well. Uh, well, for Sel Selznick's not up there. He's much more constrained by meditation on what he takes to be the normative practices in the world. Thank you. <laughs>